All right, we are recording. We got my cans on. The recording thing is is doing its its thing, and uh, yeah, we're ready to go. Hey, you, and welcome, folks. My name's Mike, and in this old podcast, pod, man, it's still it's still kind of weird to say that, you know. Even though it's just me in audio form, I'm so used to saying, you know, video. It's it's man, it's gonna take some some getting getting used to. And today, uh, well, here before we get into it. Let's just, let's just chill out, you know what I mean? Take off your shoes, sit down, rest those dogs. Although, you know, if you're outside or driving or something while you're listening to this, uh, just don't. So, you know, how you doing? Uh, let the record show I am doing finger guns out of the mic. So this is the That Chapter podcast, if you can believe that. If you thought this was something else, gotcha, sucker. So this is is a potty I've been working on for some time. Uh, you might know me better on YouTube, promo time that chapter on YouTube. Give it a goo, subscribe, and like, and click the bell, and all that kind of bullshit. Um, so if you follow me on YouTube, you probably would have noticed that I've recently, like in the last couple of months, I went down from two videos a week to one video a week, and this is the reason why. You know, YouTube is great, um, but you know, I really wanted to start a podcast because on YouTube, you're kind of confined like a little bit. You have guidelines. You kind of have to stick to a format. You're constantly kind of, um, you're constantly going up against an algorithm. And here, well, here there ain't no rules, baby doll. So on this podcast, I'll be talking about a lot of similar stuff as I do in YouTube, true crime cases, all that good stuff. But also here I can, I feel like I'll have a bit more freedom, you know, to get into weirder topics, historical true crime, maybe some, maybe some ooh, creepy shit. And maybe have a friend or two on from, from time to time to have a little, little sleepover and tell some scary stories and talk about girls. But really folks, you know, I think that's probably enough patter. Um, which uh, by patter, I just mean me generally just kind of shiting on as I do. So let's get into this old uh, podcast. <laughs> this is a podcast. In this episode, I'll be telling you two stories, folks, so listen up. They're stories of revenge. Revenge is a dish best served with a side of ice cream because, you know, it's it's like supposed to be uh, cold. And in this one, it's like dead cold. It's like ice, ice, baby. One story is from Nebraska, the other Texas, and both were blind pursuits uh, in which innocence, well, I mean, I suppose kind of all the victims are innocents, but people beside who they wanted got got. Because the people who had the fire in their eyes didn't care who they were going to get, but they themselves would get got. And real quick, folks, you know, I just want to say if you enjoy this episode, and I hope you do, your enjoyment is my goal. Please, you know, leave me a, a mother effing review and stars, many stars, folks. It really does help out the podcast as we keep going forward. And I cannot thank you enough if you do. Now. Let's give it a go. On the 13th of March, 2008, in the lovely quiet neighborhood of Dundee, Omaha, 11-year-old Tom Hunter was returning from a good old day. Most of my school days weren't good, but... um, I'm happy for him. Uh, He was returning home from a good old day at school just after 3 p.m. His home was a, you know, a beautiful upper class, upper middle class home in the suburbs. Picture an upper class, middle upper class home in the suburbs, you know, in your brain. You got it. Yeah, it's just like that. So at the home was 57-year-old Shirley Sherman, who cleaned the house every Thursday. Now, Tom, he wasn't an only child. There were four boys in a family, two grown, one in university, but leaving Tom the only one who was still at home as he was the youngest. You know, a sweet kid, glasses, big head of hair. Tom's mother was in Hawaii at the time. She was she was a doctor. She was attending a conference. Tom's dad wouldn't be back home for, for a couple of hours as he... Like the mother, he, he was a doctor too, working at Creighton University Hospital in central Omaha. Tom's dad, William, he ran the pathology program. However, when Tom's dad, Dr. William Hunter, did finally return, he came back home to a horrific, a horrific scene. Both Tom and Shirley had been murdered. Both had been killed with knives. Shirley, a grandmother of five, still had the knife sticking out of her neck. When the investigation began, it was really, it was really fucking weird. 
There were no signs of any sort of struggle, no mess, no fingerprints, no bloody footprints, or any of the stuff you would, you, you, you know, the stuff you would usually expect to find. None of that shit and nothing stolen. Both the murder weapons, the, the knives, did come from inside the house. Tom's dad, Dr. William Hunter, was then interviewed by the police. Do you have any idea who or why somebody would do something like this? Honestly, I've been just racking my brain. I mean, I live a very peaceful existence, uh, almost ridiculously simple. So the investigation and, you know, who could be behind this, um, it, it kind of stumped police from, like, the get-go. Nice neighborhood, no known enemies. I mean, even if they had, who the shit would murder an 11-year-old boy and a housekeeper, right? A random, horrific, you know, home invasion and attack? Tom, he was a quiet, sciencey kid. He got along well at school, but he had uno interest that, that kind of piqued the investigator's interest from, from early on. He loved his Xbox 360. I mean, come on, who doesn't? I remember playing the shit out of Halo, Gears of War 2, you know, blasting the shite out of folks. And now the police began to wonder if his online activity had had, had some real world consequences. I've said it once and I'll say it again, folks. Teabagging can be a dangerous game. Even when police arrived at the house after being uh, alerted by William Hunter, the Xbox was still on. Play around on chat rooms or anything wow. like that that you might be nervous about? I mean, I don't know. He's on. He's the only chat room I know he's on is Wyville. Wyville, it's like a, a children's online game thing. It's, it's like... Um, kind of like some for preschoolers, but it, it was his Xbox Live account that the police were more interested in. Who was he chatting with online? I mean, you know, these people are anonymous, right? So while you might think, you know, 69 no scope 420 is just another kid and it, <laughs> he's epic, it, it could literally be anyone, obviously. So did someone, you know, rage quit a little, a little too ragey? And it, it turned out that Tom talked with roughly 50 people online regularly. So that's like a good, already, you know, already you're off to a good start with a good list of people the police might want to talk to. So that was one qu quotation marks lead. Another was who the neighbors had seen that day walk near the home. Described as a male with olive complexion, heavy shoulder bag. And they were able to get a description of his car too with out of state plates. This was put out, but still the investigation had to had to continue then any roads it could until they could identify this fella. I mean, he was seen, but he could have just been a passerby. Who knows? Now, a lot of the investigation was focused on Tom. It was, you know, it was never really believed that Shirley Sherman was the target. She was, she was a, a sweet, she was, you know, the cleaner. She was a sweet, you know, middle-aged woman. If she had been the target, she would have been targeted elsewhere. The murders occurred in the Hunter home, so, you know, it'd be unlikely if someone who was after Shirley, they would do it there, right? They would have waited for her to, to go home and, and then go get her, get got then. And so, as time went by, you know, leads got thinner and thinner, and the suspects quickly became, they became non-existent. Um, all leads were traced, the police tracked down every single one of, of Tom's Xbox Live contacts, resulting in jack shit, and that this, the description. You know, of the, of the person the witness had seen out that day didn't leave anywhere. And so it was the parents of Tom, doctors William and Claire, that the police began to think may have been the, the real, the actual targets of this. They they just simply hadn't hadn't been there. William was a member of the pathology department, and he oversaw students coming, you know, true true training. So, you know, you, you gotta hear of the possibility of it being a, a disgruntled co-worker, or possibly you know, a student, as he would oversee many, coming true. However, going through all that, the investigators ran into another dead end. Possible suspects who may have had a grudge were, were ruled out at the time of the murders. The family of Shirley Sherman ended up offering a reward of $50,000 for information. They hired a private investigator, but this led to nothing new. Nothing, you know, the investigators hadn't already covered. And so, time passed. A lot of time. In May of 2013, so five years, years, folks, later, something else happened. 
On the morning of the 14th of May, 2013, piano movers arrived at a house in West Omaha. However, no one answered the L knocker. On the ground, in the porch, was a handgun magazine. Not, um, usually a good sign, better, better call the cops. And in the home was nothing better. Let me put it that way. I gotta check the well-being at 11421 Shirley Street. 11421 Shirley Street. Says he went there to get a piano from an elderly couple. The door was partially open. He yelled for him, got no response. Saw a gun clip laying close to the door. He exited and is now waiting for you. I'm in your squad. I got two parties down inside. An older man's body was just inside, multiple gunshot wounds and a stab wound to the right side of his neck. Another victim, an older female, was also nearby. She too had a stab wound to the neck. Unlike the first scene though, this time there seemed to have been some kind of, some kind of struggle, you know, the, the dropped pistol magazine, blood all around the place. Again, knives were nearby, knives which came from inside the home. Nothing stolen, no fingerprints, no trap. So the police, this was all sounding very familiar. The police quickly came to the realization that this was most likely done by the same guy who had killed, you know, young Tom and Shirley five years previous. You, fucker struck again. And so when the victims were identified, well, that showed an even stronger link to the previous victims. Again, five years back. The man, the elderly man that was found was Roger Brumbach. A doctor, a retired doctor rather, at Creighton University Hospital. And he worked at, you guessed it, the pathology department. Same as Tom's dad, Dr. William Hunter. It gave, it gave credence, you know, to the theory at the time that William may have been the one with the bullseye on him. There, it didn't seem like this was a coincidence anymore. His wife, the woman who's found dead, was Mary Brumbach, but it was, you know, pretty quickly it seemed like she definitely wasn't the, wasn't the real target. They both had last been heard from a few days before on Mother's Day. Roger had actually been in the process of retiring from Creighton and moving, hence why the piano movers were there. He was on the way out. So, two double homicides, both linked to Creighton Hospital, and not just the hospital, the pathology department. Is the pathology department haunted? William Hunter and Roger Brumbach knew each other. They, they knew each other well. So you got, like this, this is crazy. Crime scenes, pretty similar. All victims stabbed in the neck, though a gun was involved in the second crime. But there was also five years in the difference. And not only that, four days, four, count them, after the investigation into the Brumbach double homicide began, another, <laughs> yeah, another member of that same, exact same pathology department called the police saying that on Mother's Day, the same day the Brumbachs were last known to be alive, a person had tried to break into their home, they just happened to be out at the time. So, you know, you got, can't, like, this is getting crazy with that pathology department. One person, their son was killed. Another person who had retired from there was killed along with their wife. And the same day that person was killed, another person who worked there, their house was, somebody had tried to break into their house. A task force was quickly set up to find the killer that was stalking, or I guess the only way to say, hospital staff. The focus of the investigation returned to, returned to, well, I mean, all roads at this point led to Creighton Hospital. Delving into the depths of the department, try saying that three times fast, they went back years, I'm talking years, into the personnel files. They delved greedily and deep, my friends. And get this, right? All the way back in 2001, so seven years before this case started with the murders of Tom and Shirley, a name came up. One Anthony Garcia. Tony, Tom, had been a resident in the Creighton Pathology Department and had a complaint filed against him by the family of someone he had done an autopsy on. This was documented in an email from Dr. William Hunter to Dr. Roger Brumbach, which read, and I do quote, On Monday, February 19th, 2001, at 8.30 a.m., I received a phone call from Bob at Boyd Brayman Mortuary in Omaha, Nebraska, regarding a weekend autopsy performed by Dr. Anthony Garcia on a patient, Goldie Delancey. He was very unhappy about what he found when he obtained the body after the autopsy. 
He found the body lying face down, which markedly distorted the face. He found this completely unacceptable and intended to discuss the problem with the family. This is completely unacceptable for the resident to allow this to happen. Please investigate this incident as soon as possible. As I said, this was in 2001, seven years before this case really kicked off. So that was the first complaint against Dr. Garcia. And then he was later terminated from Creighton University Hospital for unprofessional conduct towards another resident. His termination letter was signed by doctors William Hunter and Roger Brumbach. And not only that, while, uh, you know, uh, at Creighton University, he complained to his chief resident about another doctor, Dr. Chandra Butra, saying she had ins insolent behavior, you know, and on many occasions she had humiliated, degraded, and insulted him. Chandra Butra was the woman who reported someone had tried to break into their house the same day the Brombachs had been killed. She learned of his complaint and wrote, Bill, William Hunter, well, how many documentations do you need? I think we have enough cause for immediate termination of a first year resident. So she had a hand in his firing as well. She also once gave him a very poor evaluation, saying he was passive aggressive, had very poor knowledge and lacked initiative and interest. He was a, a dumb sack of shit. Uh, how did this asshole pass medical school? Well, uh, to be fair, he certainly showed initiative and interest now. Anthony, he, he was just, um, he seemed to not be an easy person to get along with. He had previously been dismissed from other residency programs, beginning with his firing from a New York medical residency in 1999, fired from other jobs, been denied medical licenses in other states. And after he left Creighton, well, rather, I, I guess I should say was fucked out of Creighton, Every time he would apply for a medical license, a quick check with Creighton University Hospital would uh, uh, deny him one. That happened about seven or eight times. You know, once or twice, okay. Three times, you're taking the piss. You know, fucking almost ten times, pal, just take a hike. Like, at this point, come on, it's on you, like, not on everybody else. And then, you know, when he had to explain himself when he would apply for medical licenses, this is how we put it. So here's a letter Anthony wrote when applying for a medical license in Indiana in 2012, four years after he had already begun to enact his revenge. I was essentially fired from St. Elizabeth Family Practice Residency when I worked there because I yelled at a radiology technician. I was essentially fired from Creighton Medical Pathology Residency when I worked there because I called a pathology resident and told him his vacation was not approved. By the way, just to point out, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Fuck this guy, Tony, he was not like the chief resident. He was just a regular residency guy, so I don't know how he could approve or disprove somebody else's vacation when he was not in that position. Let's move on. I left the University of Illinois in Chicago Pathology Residency when I worked there due to poor health migraine headaches. I was essentially fired from Shreveport, Louisiana Psychiatry Residency when I worked there due to failing to get a medical license because I did not disclose the above information. I did not disclose the above information to the states of California and Indiana and withdrew my medical license applications. I have medical license applications pending in the state of Texas, Indiana, and Kentucky. So... <laughs> It's pretty funny uh, how he wrote it, because it's also wrote, written in a, in a very passive-aggressive tone. He states that he is uh, an angry dickhead. He's a... He, he's, like, uh, he's an arrogant bastard. He makes excuses for himself by saying, ooh, I had a headache. And he admits he was a liar. So... But the way, but the way he tells the story... Hey, listen, guys, I'm the victim here. Tony rules! Suck my sausage! I don't know why he would have a, that kind of accent, but anyway. Essentially, his career was shut down by the people he was seeking revenge against. I mean, though you could possibly argue the victims may have had a, a grudge against them, maybe <laughs> fucked him over, though that's not an excuse. In Anthony Garcia's case, he was just a shit doctor, shit pathologist, shit human being. Also, the witness from 2008, yeah, the, it looked like him. Tony was a heavy guy, olive complexion, short black hair, sack of shit. He also owned a gun, one that was just purely like randomly found on a highway 20 miles from his home, and that matched the magazine clip found in the Brumbach porch. That was pure luck they found that, by the way. 
following a paper trail, his credit card, they also found out he was in Omaha the day of the Brumbach murders. He was seen on CCTV buying a few suds and he had searched for the addresses of his victims on his computer, the Brumbachs and Butra's address that he had been Googling it. And so the investigators traveled to Terre Haute, Indiana to where Anthony Garcia lived. However, when they rocked up, Anthony was gone. Tracking his phone a ping every 30 minutes, he was driving, he was in Illinois driving north. He was pulled over pretty quickly, drunk as a skunk. Inside his car, they found a gun, bullets, a sledgehammer, and a crowbar. But what they also found was an LSU lab coat and stethoscope. He'd worked there now for about, for about six months, but then, because his license hadn't been approved, he was fired from LSU in 2008. So he, I guess you kind of, you know, got to wonder, did the doctors there make his list too? But I mean, he was driving in the opposite direction. But he's also drunk, so you never know. When questioned about the Omaha murders, he shut up, or shut down, rather, um, completely. The police then searched his home in Terre Haute, and although he had a Ferrari outside, inside, uh, wow, the place was a dump. That's what, that's what they call, uh, you know, an all dick no balls move. Johnny Flash. He'd spent all the money from his non-existent medical license on a Ferrari, it appears. You know, if ever you come into a lot of money, buy a sports car and spend no money on anything else. It's really like investment 101. His home was about to be foreclosed and on the table were a load of insurance documents and all that kind of stuff. So that led the police to think that um, Tony wasn't planning on coming home. One note, weird as shit, read, Into the fight we go, we live, we die, we live, we die. Okay, nerd. Anthony Garcia wasn't planning on being around too much longer. It seemed that he was like super sloppy too. Uh, he more or less detailed his stalking on papers left at the home, and then like he had planned to flee to Canada or to New, New Orleans and out the Gulf, or he was just kind of, I don't really know what his plan was. I don't think he knew. I mean, he was driving north when they caught him, so possibly he decided to go to Canada, but who knows? Who knows with this, with this cat? When it came to trial, it was pretty clear the motive was revenge. His firing from Creighton prevented him from working in medicine ever again. You know, every time he would apply, Creighton would, would pop up and he would get, thanks for your application, many thanks for your application, but unfortunately, yada, yada, yada. He wanted to get back at Dr. Hunter, at Dr. Brumbach, at Dr. Butra. He couldn't get at Dr. Hunter, so he got his son and his cleaner. He did get to a retiring Dr. Brumbach and his wife, and he tried to get to Dr. Butra. She just happened to be out when he arrived at her home. In fact, the murders correlated with his employment history. Well, I guess his rather lack of employment history. The first double homicide occurred in 2008, and it came just two weeks after he was fired from LSU. The murder of the Brumbachs happened six months after the Indiana Professional Licensing Agency denied his medical license. Now, to the defense, this is all, take, take a chill pill, this is all circumstantial. Um, but, big booty, there was a witness. During the trial, the prosecution called a witness, a former stripper, who said that, in 2012, well, here, she can speak for herself. I'm putting on my little voice and saying, well, Dr. Tony, I only like bad boys. I'm a bad girl. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't handle a girl like me. And then that's when he told me. He told me I wasn't as good as he thought he was. He said, I killed people before. He said, I killed a young boy and an old woman. See, Anthony Garcia used to go to a strip club she worked at a lot and became... Um, <laughs> he became, I guess, infatuated with her, clingy, you know, a, a simp, if you will. And when she was like, no, well, first of all, she probably shouldn't, she shouldn't take customers, but she was like, you know, you know, she she tried to let him down gently. She was like, listen here, honey, I only date bad boys. He's too good for her, you know, as a doctor. Um, well, Anthony, when she said this to him, Anthony's response to this was like, well, here, listen up, babe, I'm a bad boy. I killed people. Ah, uh, yep, that'll impress her. Well, it didn't impress the jury, who found Anthony Garcia guilty. In 2018, Anthony Garcia was sentenced to death. He is still on death row today. You know, one interesting thing about this case is that in the book, 
Pathological, which, which documents this case by Henry J. Cordes and Todd Cooper, it seems that Garcia's name actually came up just days after the murder of Tom Hunter and Shirley Sherman in 2008. Like, at the very beginning of this case, Tony Garcia came up. Just four days after the killings, a Creighton University admissions official listed Tony and four other medical residents as possible suspects in regards to the Tom Hunter and Shirley Sherman murders. But it seems like they did nothing. So, th so his name came up four days after the murders, and then two months after the murders, his name and his possible grudge were more expressly mentioned when someone emailed to get him to Omaha police detectives and suggested, you know, maybe you should uh, look into them. So two people brought up Anthony Garcia right, you know, as the investigation was kicking off. The sender of that May 11th, 2008 email even hinted, hinted at a possible motive. That Tony, a medical resident who had been fired from Creighton University, had just been disciplined by a Louisiana medical licensing board for not disclosing his Creighton termination. Dr. William Hunter, the dad you know, of the victim and the, the real target, even briefly mentioned his name to the police. Despite those tips, there is little to no evidence that Omaha police followed up on those leads over the next five years until he killed again. Well done. Absolutely. Still knocked it out of the park yet again. That is until the Brumbach murders. You know, the police would try to defend themselves saying, hey, listen, come on now, y'all. We had hundreds of tips. So, you know, it's just one we missed. Good. It happens to everybody. But it, I guess it just goes to show that no matter how, you know, how small or insignificant, sometimes they can be the exact thing that, that cracks the case. Though, unfortunately, as we see here, other times they just get lost in the fog. Well, that's the end of uh, Anthony Garcia, folks. Uh, key message here, is, I, I guess if you, if you ever get fired for being a useless piece of shit, uh, maybe just look at your own issues before killing. Just a hint, maybe. And now, folks, here is story number two. It's hard to top, it's hard to top the, the Tony Garcia tale, but this one, honestly, I can't think it does. Texas has a reputation for for a lot of things. One of them being uh, cowboys. You know, yeehaw! Am I right? Right? And you know, when I think of cowboys, one story, um, one story which kind of always comes up about cowboys is the tale of revenge. You know, someone wronged and seeking payback. Well, okay, this story it doesn't have cowboys, so. Sorry. Um, instead of a horse, we have a Segway. So um, a modern horse, if you will, if you're a fucking loser. But we do have a story of revenge and a justice of the peace gone rogue in the town of Kaufman, Texas. Let's giddy up. Kaufman is a small place in northeast Texas. It, it lies not too far from Dallas. Population about seven and a half thousand people. It's a rural enough place. You know, blink and you'll miss it kind of deal. Yo. It is the seat of... Kaufman County, which has over 100,000 people in it. And in 2013, like like something ahead of a thriller, folks here, uh, prosecutors, prosecutors started dying one by one. Like seriously, you can't, you can't write this shit. I mean, you could, you could write this in a book, but it would sound like shit. But this is real. This is the shit. Mark Hasse was a very experienced prosecutor, having spent years going after organized gangs in the Dallas District Attorney's Office. Bit of a kind of a Harvey Dent style, you know what I mean? Um, but he had moved to Kaufman to essentially, you know, slow down a little bit, get out of the crowded city life. And so, and so he started working at the Kaufman County District Attorney's Office as Assistant District Attorney, working under newly elected District Attorney Mike McClelland. And he seemed to be, you know, a, a great prosecutor and was generally well-liked by everyone in the office. Mark Hasse, he got along with his boss, Mike McClelland, you know, everything was hunky-dory. Tickety-boo. And then the 31st of January 2013 came around. Just before 9am, gunshots rang out near the courthouse in Kaufman. Five shots. Pause. Three shots. Authorities arrived quickly enough to the scene, and lying on the pavement was 57-year-old Mark Hasse. Kaufman County 901. Um, yes, sir. We've got a gentleman on Grove Street and a Madison that just got shot. Hasse! Oh my god, it's Mark Hasse. He's assistant district attorney. 
No one knew why Mark had been gunned down in broad daylight on his way into work. There were no suspects, no gun or casings found at the scene, and things were, were tense. It was, it was raising, like the balls on this person. People were on edge, to the point that DA Mike McClelland made it easy, easier for people to get a, a concealed handgun license should they need him. Though, though you know, I, that's probably just like Texas in general. <laughs> Witnesses had seen the shooting and said a man, covered up, couldn't couldn't make out his face, had escaped in the passenger seat of a silver four-door getaway car. So now we have two people involved, the shooter and the driver. And one other thing was that another witness in a, in a nearby, working away in a nearby garage had heard Mark and this killer before the shooting began. And they'd heard Mark say, no, no, I'm sorry. And then gunshots. District Attorney Mike McClelland, Mark's boss and a good friend, he was not, he, he just wasn't having any of it. He was mother heckin' ticked off. We're very confident that we're going to find you. We're going to pull you out of whatever hole you're in. We're going to bring you back and let the people of Kaufman County prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Other law enforcement officials, Texas Rangers, ATF, FBI, descended on Coffin. They were not they were not going to let, you know, someone murder one of their own. A brother! And they weren't going to let them get away with it. This became a major case. So it didn't take long to put two and two together when a prosecutor has been killed, right? So authorities, you know, they started going through everyone he had prosecuted in Coffin in the three years he had been a felony prosecutor there, here. Though there were like numerous cases, a metric uh, shit done, nothing, nothing really seemed to fit. No violent crimes, nothing that would, you know, warrant what had happened to Mark, nothing murderous and nothing related to gangs, which you also would think, you know, could be that. But he had prosecuted crimes like that back in Dallas, only 30 miles away. Back in the day, he had put away murderers, violent offenders, and some had been released by 2013. Maybe some of those people came to Kaufman for vengeance. But uh, a week into the investigation, the promising leads were simply non-existent. Four weeks later, a tip came in. A person said they were sipping down glug glug some suds in a bar in Kaufman when they heard two lads talking about the murder of Mark Hassey. And they seemed to be pr pretty um, knowledge about it, you know, kind of wink wink, hint hint. However, there wasn't enough information in the tip to follow up on it, as the tipster was anonymous. It's like, you know, it, you two people talking in a bar? Great, thanks, helpful. Uh, we can't get back to you, so you, if you'd provide a little bit more information, that would have been useful, but you didn't. So, thanks for nothing! And so, looking through the cases Mark had prosecuted, the way he was killed, execution style, you know, gangs became a key lead. Specifically, Mexican cartels, Dios mío! or even fucking Nazis, the Aryan Brotherhood. Three months before, a shitload of them had been arrested, and they had made a threat that they wanted to get even. The Coffin County DA's office had played a role in the investigation. Seven weeks after Mark's death, the head honcho of the Colorado Department of Corrections was murdered on his front door by a member of that Aryan Brotherhood, Evan Ebel. So everyone was, was becoming kind of pretty nervous that they were next especially as this Evan Ebel was still on the run. And when he was pulled over in Texas, he shot the shit out of a sheriff's deputy. Now, the deputy did survive, but uh, ooh, can't say the same for Evan uh, after a police chase and shootout. And that had happened not too far away, just on the other side of Dallas. You know, it, it's kind of it, like speaking to Evan, it, it's so funny when you look at pictures of these white supremacists and it's, um, it's always the same. You know, you look inbred. So things were looking bad, but as the weeks went by, fewer and fewer leads were coming in in the Mark Hassey case, and the number of investigators working on it started to dwindle. Then it happened again. On March 30th, 2013, almost two months, two count them, after Mark's death, friends and family were supposed you know, to pop over to the McLeans. Remember, Mike, the district attorney, for an, for an Easter dinner. And when Mike and his wife Cynthia were not answering any texts or calls, that morning a friend came over to check on, you know, if they were okay and if everything was ready for dinner. Inside were shell casings, right at the front door. Cynthia was found lying in the living room, 
and District Attorney Mike McClelland was found also. Both had been gunned down. Mike was found with shell casings like right by him. Again, like Mark, execution style. So obviously, connected. Someone, you know, going after the Kaufman District Attorney's Office started with Assistant DA Mark Hassey and then DA Mike McClelland and his wife Cynthia, which kind of is even darker. Like, a f now they're killing family members too, right? The hunt for the killer, which, you know, had started to die down, now ramped up, 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 with even more vigor as things got worse. Who could be next? So how did, you know, someone gain access to the McClelland home? There was no sign of fourth century, front door was unlocked, and Mike had guns by the front door. Obviously ones he never got a chance to use. The cases, the casings found were from an AOR-15. So a big old gun, like one you, that'd be kind of difficult to hide. Home security showed the killer entered shortly after 7 a.m. and had left just two minutes later. In that time, 20 shots were fired. So so the killer, like there wasn't footage of it, but there was, um, you know, the, the locks were recorded. So the killer probably showed up, knocked on the door. Maybe Mike knew him, opened the door, and then the killer pointed his AR-15 at him and said, let me in or you were dead meat. He let him in and he was still dead meat. About a day later, on that same anonymous tip line I, I mentioned previously about the guy overhearing someone in the bar, an email came in saying, Do we have your full attention now? The authorities replied with, um, Yeah, you, you, you got it. No shit. This anonymous person responded with exactly the ammo Mark Hassey had been killed with, something that was not, not publicly available. They then said, Your act of good faith will result in no other attacks this week. They then said they wanted one of the judges in Kaufman to step down by the end of the week, or else. We are not unreasonable, but we will not be stopped. Someone was going after the entire system. So obviously someone local, which ruled out, you know, cartels or the Aryan Brotherhood, but everyone working in law enforcement slept with a gun under their pillow. A reward of 200,000 bucks was out for information. And scouring CCTV near the McClelland home, they got something. A white four-door car driving the morning Mike and Cynthia were shot dead. My heart goes out to all the families that have been affected by this tragedy, and, and especially to the, the people that work at the Gord House. I worked there for several years while I was going to law school, and so I know that it's a tight-knit family, and that this is devastating. What's it make you feel like uh, knowing that you've been somehow wrapped up in this? It actually, it actually makes me feel that the police are doing the thorough job they need to. Now, <laughs> doing the rounds for local reporters at this time was a man named Eric Williams. On his, 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 his riding around on his little Segway. Oh, dude, seriously, what, why, why the Segway? I'm cringing, and this is a decade later. However, he hadn't been properly interviewed by investigators at this stage because he was all lawyered up. Cooperated with law enforcement. I certainly wish them the best in bringing justice for this uh, just incredibly egregious act. So, Eric, you know, I'm, I'm trying to describe how he looks, how he looked. Um, I guess kind of generic white guy would be an understatement. It's like, you, you know when you're playing a video game and you get to the character creation screen and you get kind of like the default white man face. And then you would normally kind of add things, bigger eyes, bigger nose, you know, cool hair, a sweet ass mustache. Well, it's like they had a face on the character creation and they just didn't do anything for that. He's, it's, he's hard to describe with how boring he looks, which I guess is good for a killer, uh, I suppose, you know, no, what did he look like? Uh, he just looked like a guy. And so, two years before this all began in 2011, Eric Williams had been prosecuted by both Mark Hatsey and Mike McClelland for theft. Eric Williams, Mensa member, big brain time guys, you know, I think he thought he probably could figure all this shit out. Uh, he was also a member of the National Guard, and Eric Williams had been a lawyer and elected Justice of the Peace in Kaufman, until six months later he was charged with stealing three computer monitors. 
Computer monitors, like like the screens. What are you even gonna do with them? Like sell them? And you're a lawyer, so you're probably already ma already making some shkaro. He was uh, arrested <laughs> for stealing, I guess, uh, government property. You know those computer screens. Mark and Mike prosecuted him for this, a felony, which seemed to drive it drove that like Eric. It drove him nuts that he was being prosecuted for this. Um, but get a lot of this, right? Eric had also supported Mike McClellan's opponent in the election for district attorney. So some thought the prosecution of Eric for, you know, I mean, nothing really serious to be fair. I mean, community monitor, computer monitors, right? They, everybody thought like, this is a shit show. This is, you know, political, right? He was offered a deal, plead guilty to a misdemeanor and avoid jail. He refused. He wasn't gonna give in to his opponents. Eric ended up not going to jail. But he did lose his licenses, his ability to be elected, everything. Mark Hassey said of Eric in the closing arguments for the high-profile computer monitor theft case, This guy sitting over at the end of the defense table is an elected official, but is nothing more than a thief and a burglar. Mike McClelland, during the trial, telephoned the Texas National Guard base where Eric Williams served to inform them that he was facing criminal charges. So that does in my opinion, it seemed like they were really out to fucking get Eric Williams, which would get his goat. He's gonna be friggin' pissed, obviously, about that. Understandable. Though, maybe just how pissed, no one uh, really knew. So, during the investigation, Eric Williams' lawyers, they, they, they stopped representing him as the heat turned up, and Texas Rangers went over, battle chat, and they started to look around his place. They found gun parts, ones that matched the weapons used in both murder scenes. It turned out he'd also been doing a bit of the old clackety clackety googling of both Mark and Mike before the killings. Something he he lied about? I, I have no interest. Water under the bridge! Um, but they had proof uh, of it, like, you know, <laughs> internet history proof. Getting a warrant, they also found out he owned the car under a false name, seen by a witness near where Mark Hassey uh, had been shot dead, and also seen on CCTV near the McClelland home. They also found on his computer he'd been googling the attorneys involved in the current investigation. So not only was he going to go after, you know, everybody involved in getting him, you know, fired and, and prosecuted and losing all his licenses, he was also going to go after the attorneys who were investigating this current case. He was going to kill everybody. He was just fucking trigger happy. They also found in his home a handwritten note. That was the user ID from the anonymous tip system, the one that claimed responsibility for the attacks. And also the earlier tip when someone said they overheard people talking about Mark Hassi's death in a bar. So not only was he the person who emailed in saying they had uh, overheard people talking about the, the murder in a bar, but he also was the one claiming responsibility for the attacks. Eric Williams was then arrested for making a terrorist threat. Not for murder. Not yet. Not enough evidence. The next day, a friend of Eric's called the police, telling them he had rented a, a storage unit to Eric, and it was there that they found the car they had been looking for. Previously, they'd only found the documents that he owned it, now they actually found it. They also found police uniforms, vests, badges, a shitload of ammo, and a shitload of guns. They also found jars, homemade napalm, like he was gonna go out big style. They also had CCTV footage of him going into that storage unit the morning of the McClellan deaths, right before he went to their house and then returning right after, like bing, bang, boom. However, the labs reveal that none of those weapons were, in fact, the actual murder weapons. But, I mean, at this stage, they had enough to go on. And Eric Williams was charged with three counts of capital murder, the motive being revenge against Mark and Mike, who had prosecuted him. In December 2013, Eric Williams went on trial, first off for the murder of Cynthia. The prosecutors, you know, they wanted to be sure they had their ducks in a row, hence why he was tried separately for each. The defense, though, went, well, they never found the murder weapon. So what are you on about? This is political. After 90 minutes, the jury found him guilty. But what happened to be a, a kind of um, a strange series of events was that after Mark Hassey's death, uh, District Attorney Mike McClellan, he suspected Eric Williams from the start, before he even showed up at his own door. He was even questioned shortly after Mark's death. 
you know, when the cops rocked up to his door saying, hey, you kind of had a disagreement with the assistant DA. You might, did you shoot him? But Eric Williams, he answered the door in a sling from, quote, some injury or another. His hands were tested for gunshot residue, but no, no dice. So he said he just put on a sling, a fake sling, was like, hey, could a guy with one arm have done that? I don't think so. And remember how the witness said that at the Mark Hassey murder, the perpetrator had gotten into, into the passenger seat. Remember the driver of the first shooting? Well, who happened to be driving but star witness Eric's wife, Kim Williams. Eric and Kim, they'd been married for 15 years. She'd been brought in shortly after Eric's arrest and after a kind of a brief resistance, she cooperated and told the investigators she not only knew about the murders, she had helped in them as the getaway driver and lookout in both. She also told the court how Eric threw a black bag with the murder weapons off a bridge one night, hence why they were never found. She was brought into court during the penalty phase to ensure Eric got the maximum sentence. She also told how Eric had one more person, like another person on his list, a judge he planned to kill with a crossbow of all things interesting. Eric Williams was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Due to this, the prosecutors, they, they declined to try him with the death of Mike McClelland and Mark Hassey. Kim Williams, though she cooperated, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And that's the story of that one. A, a twisted tale of revenge that Eric Williams, with all the weapons he had, was prepared to go to war against Kaufman for, for what had happened to him. Maybe just, just kind of a, a titch, a tad, overblown. Um, but he was just ready to blow, to burn the, the place down. Well, bet he wish he didn't steal those computer monitors uh, now. Ooh, it's kind of awkward. And there you have it, folks. There you go. That's for this old podcast. Two stories of revenge. One, a Texas-style revenge tale. Another, a Nebraska-style revenge tale. Uh, I hope you found them interesting. These are crazy cases. Both of these cases, by the way, I've actually covered in video form on the That Chapter YouTube channel. So if that sounds like something you'd be keen to watch, you know, I've got the footage and my ugly mug telling you a story, please give that a gander or a goo or whatever you want to do. But that's this old podcast for now. Oh, please, uh, leave, if you wouldn't mind like leaving a review, uh, maybe a couple of stars, some decent ones, that would be incredibly helpful. And I would give you a big old smooch right now if I could. I'm going to lick your ear. Audio form though for now. Um, and right, that does it here, guys. Please, you know, stay safe. I'll see you. I won't be seeing you. God damn, I'm still getting used to this whole podcast thing of like talking differently because you'll hear from me. I'll be talking to you um, in a couple of days. So look forward to that. But until then, please, as always, look after each other. Look after yourselves because I love you. Mike out.